Health is one of the oldest women's peace organization. We put a lot of emphasis on the human dimension of violence in a broad sense. And uh, of course, war is one of the hor most horrible stories of violence. It is, um, it is really a heavy and a very sad day, this 24th of February. And I think the first thing I have to say is I join the morning, the morning, the desperation of so many women and children and people as such exposed to terrible violence, to the destruction of their lives the loss of home, of property, of friends, families, and all what made their life viable. I can sometimes imagine the alarms waking them up in the middle of the night. And I hear a lot of stories. And uh, I remember with these stories of especially also the women. I re strongly remember the cries of the women in black in the Balkans, where sexual violence was massively used as a weapon of war and where healing procedures are ongoing since 30 years. And in, uh, in addition, tensions, political tensions, social disaster are still uh, their reality and even growing. And yeah, I remember also the stories of my grandmothers who long time did not talk about what happened in the war. And as a member of WILF, I hear uh, like uh, Lida Gustava Heimann, one of the founding members, said in 1915, women can never be protected in war. And she made an appeal to the people at this time in Europe not to let this war go on. So there is a long commitment behind. At the same time, coming back to Ukraine, I remember there are so many encouraging pictures also from Ukraine of ongoing school in shelters, cooking in metro stations, feminist solidarity, also on the logistic level, um, defense of the Istanbul Convention, the documentation of war crimes. There is a lot of positive energy going on. And I see also in my German neighborhood, the children trying to adapt to where they live now and survive in their forced exile. The women with whom we speak here also, who don't know if they would ever return. At least those who have found a job, uh, a decent life here, and fear partners who have gone willingly or unwillingly through terrible experiences with war and violence. And war is terrible from a human perspective. And this is much more than uh, a political view on uh, geostrategy. They are these traumatized and injured men serving totally exhausted in the army or being under permanent threat of recruitment against their will, the discreditation and the criminalization of consciousness objectors and their supporters. You all know also the example of Olga Karaj from Belarus, who is really threat under threat because of this support. And we see these 
articles on the, the horror of the war are coming closer, also in our media. And nearly absent of the discussion is instead the investment in healing the trauma and investing more in the social and ecological consequences under ongoing war. And I really see the, this uh, as a, one of the, the biggest problem. What will be the future of such a country with a completely destroyed infrastructure in a poisoned land for agricultural production and the trauma of the people? Um, yeah, are people uh, resisting believing in victory? Are they heroes? Where does us patriotism lead? And where does the priority to always heavier weapons lead us? And where is the turning point also for Ukrainians to lose hope? These are all very burning questions and we all have more questions than answers. Solidarity, networking, creating space for dialogue is needed and this is the most important need from a human and humanitarian point of view. But as women, as peace builders, we have also an additional responsibility. We need to strengthen us mutually to talk about ending the war, organizing pathways to peace, as we did also uh, in Vienna. Uh, invest in niches of this peace building to encourage and request diplomacy on all levels. And we must not abandon disarmament as a fundamental principle of solving conflicts. Disarmament does not only concern weapons, but this is a strong conviction to believe in justice in chances for non-violent conflict solution, in trainings, in peace education. And we need investments starting from our brain to the, the concrete budgets. As my colleagues in Austria, for example, request a higher budget for civilian conflict solution and even uh, with the vision of a peace ministry. Yeah, in this actual narrow focus on weaponry, I see a high risk even in the peace movement, in my old women's peace organization, a high risk in this uh, um, important um, discussions going around feminist foreign policy to talk still about disarmament. And I think we contribute building islands for peace and justice with the people affected most by the war, the violence and the injustice. And we have to promote positive neighborhoods and cross-border dialogues. I know that this is extremely difficult and they are is a need of enormous courage, like Oven, for example, in Berlin, do it, trust building since many years, but now also coming back to first discuss within the communities what they can offer to come together again. But this is so needed. We oppose, we, and we have to continue to, propose, uh, to oppose profit and privileges of warfare. And we emphasize on prevention in all uh, conflict levels. It's a heavy task because, for example, the public discourse 
also in my country, in Germany, completely changed. We call it times have changed. And, but I have to say, and I come to an end, the, on this day of commemoration of two years of this war, independently of what John mentioned to the other wars going around, we refuse the normalization of war. And we insist that pacifism is not, as our chancellor in Germany said, the devil, but an active commitment in a broader peace perspective. Militarism is shifting the budgetary priorities away from care and canceling and discrediting peace conferences, discussing the pathways to peace, including disarmament initiatives, diplomacy, ceasefires, is a risk also for etern internal peace of our societies and in the values that we pretend always to defend. At the end, I would say we need to go on as peace activists. Thank you. given to me was the importance of the global south and finding peaceful resolutions. Now, I believe that to look at the global south and look for it for some creative resolutions, I think one has to first ask two questions, that is, or understand two questions. And one is, how is the global south framing this war? What is the context of this framing? And how do parties to the conflict see the Global South and the Global South position in and power in the international arena? And therefore, what can the Global South uh, offer for peace? Now, as far as how is the Global South framing this war, as you all know, it's very different than how the Euro-Atlantic Alliance is framing uh, this war. Um, and that is... Um, We've seen all the UN resolutions on Ukraine so far, at least in the beginning, everyone kind of, they know it's a war is illegal. They said that, that the Russian invasion was wrong and they all asked for peaceful negotiation. But of course, significant numbers, including the large, large countries like India and uh, South Africa and some others uh, abstained. Uh, as did several, you know, substantial number of African countries, they continuously abstained, saying that they were going to be neutral. But they, all of them, including those who condemned the war, they, in their national discourses, they did say that Russia had some legitimate security concerns. And number two, they don't approve of sanctions. They've never approved for unilateral sanctions because so far it was the Global South who was subject to sanctions. In the last, um, let's say, even 30 years of the uh, 80, about 86 countries of the Global South, including India, have faced uh, the US sanctions. So they, they oppose sanctions and unless they're from the United Nations. Uh, so... Uh, and even as the Global South does not speak in one voice, has no one coordinating center, uh, they have framed this war where they see that this is a war between Russia and the US-led NATO, where Ukraine is actually a victim. Uh, and they believe that Russia has had secure, legitimate security interests because, for, for example, they would not like to have NATO or missiles on their borders. I mean, like, for example, if Pakistan became part of NATO with missiles on the Indian borders, they would definitely, uh, you know, have a thing or two to, to say. So uh, second, I think they all believe that the US does have a hegemonic agenda and uh, they have taken advantage of Ukraine's internal conflicts and anxieties and incapacities and they, everyone in the Global South is saddened, as Lisa said, about the lack of any diplomatic or even. I know your mic just muted. 
It was a war which need not have happened. Uh, and there were many opportunities of peace that were lost. Also, the Global South, many, most, a lot of the countries have specific national interests. They have trade with Russia, which they've not stopped. 38 countries of the Global South get arms from Russia, including um, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, UAE, all of Central Asia, et cetera. Uh, they are dependent on uh, Russian hydrocarbons in a very major way. Uh, the development uh, of these countries who lag behind, as you know, the Global South was the so-called underdeveloped. They're in the process of development. They need these resources. And moreover, they don't see Russia as a threat, unlike, sadly, that Central East Europe does, because they were never colonized by Russia. And they recall that there's a memory of uh, Russian support, support to the decolonization movements. Uh, and they see a continuity of post-colonial policies, which are more stark in the West than they have been in the last 20 years. There was a belief that the West was no longer as colonial or neo-colonial, but now suddenly that uh, that aspect of the West as um, almost neo-colonial uh, has come back. And of course, they see the double standards on the issues of human rights, and this is and they've linked also. Many of the countries have linked how um, the West has supported Israel vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Palestine. So. These are these two conflicts which um, in which the West has a major role. So the second question, how do these parties of conflicts then see the global South? They see them as, as weak, as former colonies, as intellectually lacking, and they see them basically as useful resources for a continuation of Western primacy and world order. So therefore, my last uh, kind of point is, so what is the importance of the Global South in finding peaceful resolutions? I think first is listen and ask and think of why they have been neutral since World War II, since they got independence, and why they continue. And this neutrality is not really neutral as you understand it in Europe. It is non-alignment. That is, they take a position when they believe uh, it is normative. So they are supporting, most of them, 99% are supporting the Palestinian co uh, cause. Recently, there was a meeting of the non-aligned in Kampala, Uganda, and there were very strong uh, uh, resolutions on Palestine. So they do take positions. They want non-militarism and support to development, even though they are militarized within. They don't want this external militarism and um, uh, because it endangers them. The polarization of the world and the possibility and a clear possibility of a new Cold War goes against development, against food security, against climate, environment, and the global South is the one which is going to suffer. And therefore, large number of countries of the global South have actually offered and proposed mediation. I don't know if it came in the Western press, but African countries collectively had said they would um, like to mediate. Brazil has offered mediation. Uh, India even recently in the last um, two weeks uh, has said that they, they, they're ready for uh, being a mediator. But this neither comes in the Western press and nor is it taken seriously. So really um, uh, the Global South does have, you know, they've not, it's not hegemonic, it's never been hegemonic, and it's unlikely to be hegemonic. Uh, they believe in multipolarity, and that's where they feel development for them and the rest of the world lies. And multipolarity means inclusiveness and a more democratic order. It, it means global disarmament and so on. So I conclude lastly by saying that I see that our work in civil society is to put pressure for ceasefire, for negotiated peace, to cut through the fog created by the dominant narratives in this war, to document and retell the truths of this war, because as what I see sometimes in the Western press and how it is actually just a partial truth just completely shocks me because we had the greatest faith in, you know, Guardian and New York Times, et cetera. But 
they're not telling the full story on any of these wars, whether it's on Palestine or whether it's on Ukraine, Russia. So uh, really, uh, that is what civil society can do, use these alternate channels and argue for common security, for collaborative security, uh, and opposed to exclusive military alliances and the real and constructed threats. The real threats being the threat on climate, on poverty, on want, on fear, uh, and the constructed threats about each other, um, you know, exaggerated threats, I would say. Some of them might be there. And I believe ultimately that there is no third way possible because there is no planet B. Thank you very much. On the question of who, who, um, who makes profit um, from war, because I think we often we often forget that. Um, so I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but also just to say um, before I get into that, just to express my solidarity. I don't know if there's anyone on here from Ukraine. I know Yuri was going to join, um, but I think he might be involved in, in an event in, in Ukraine. But just to express my solidarity with anyone who may be on the call who's from Ukraine. Um, and also with the peace movements in, in Russia and Belarus as well, who've been really active in trying to bring about peaceful solutions. I realize I'm, I'm doing this participation from the security of my own home. I'm from Ireland, but I'm based at the moment in Amsterdam, but just to recognize the, the efforts that others have also in, in, in calling for peace in not so easy circumstances. Um, so um, to get into the, to the nitty gritty of what I want to talk about, it's, yeah, I suppose the complicated nature of building peace is what I was asked to discuss. And what we often look at in TNI um, is to do with who profits from war and the power structures that allow that sort of profit profiteering to take place. Um, I think we often forget who's making money from war. Um, obviously, everyone on this call, we're all peace activists and, and we're horrified by war and the logic that drives war. Um, but there are many who see war as a business opportunity and a way of making money. Um, and, and sadly, they are very much embedded in our democratic structures. Um, and so I'll get into that in a little while. But maybe just to mention, military spending has never been so high. The last CIPRI report from, from last year put it at far beyond two trillion US dollars. We've never had so much money spent on militarism before. We've also never had so many instances of war and conflict, and we've also never had so many people displaced globally. And so that brings us to the question of, is nobody joining the dots between whether uh, increased military spending is actually aimed at bringing about peace or whether it's actually about driving war and fueling further war and lining the pockets of the people who are making money from it. Um, and that brings us to another reflection, uh, which we, we may have time to get into in the discussion about, um, you know, posing the question about militarism and whether it makes us safer. Of course, it does not. But these are the kind of these are the this is the logic that we come up in up against. I think in mainstream thinking that militarism is is made to make us safer, um, and and obviously we know that that's not the case. Um, maybe to just build a very quick timeline on how we got to a situation where we now have arms companies very much embedded in our democratic. Um, structures for decision making, um, maybe starting from uh, 2001, post 9-11, we see a dramatic shift in in how war is framed on the international uh, stage. Um, we have, you know, the surge in this idea that um, you can't be, you're either with us or against us. Um, and this kind of thinking of, of you can't be on the fence or, or you have to be with us or against us. And this was, of course, the famous line that was put out by George Bush after after the 9-11 attacks. Um, and then I think it's important to remember 10 years later, we have a quote from Julian Assange after all of what we know with, with the wars that took place and, and still continue to fuel massive insecurities in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, that the goal with Afghanistan was never to have a successful war, but to have an endless war. Um, 
and Julian Assange got, um, yeah, he, he, he released lots of documents, as we know, and I mentioned him because his trial was this week and many peace activists are also very much involved in that struggle. Um, uh, the, the role of, of private co companies, private security, profiteering from war that was very much honed on the US, NATO, um, Western powers and how they rolled out their war strategies in Iraq, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then we saw a shift in how those same companies started to become very involved in securing um, borders. And so we had companies who were involved in Afghanistan and Iraq holding um, uh, fares uh, to market their wares along the border with uh, between the US and Mexico and normalizing this, uh, normalizing this idea that we would have border wars and wars on migrants, that we would militarize borders. Um, and now we have a situation, of course, in Europe where our borders are incredibly militarized and people are, who are freely move, for, you know, the right to freedom of movement, the right to seek asylum, all of these things are being encroached upon. Um, and the military industrial complex p plays a huge role in that. Um, so I think not just to, to speak about one particular war or one instance of war, but to look at the role that the military industrial complex and the arms companies are playing in fueling wars, in prolonging wars, um, in, 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 in building this constant idea that um, we need military security to keep us safe. Um, I want to mention specifically the European Union. There's obviously a, there's a myth that the European Union is a peace project. It certainly describes itself as that as all in all of its documents. But I think we all know that that is that is a myth. The European Union is is not a peace project. Um, we even have Thierry Breton, a European Commissioner, who has described us as being part of the war economy at the moment. Um, maybe to mention a bit how we got to where we are with the European Union um, and how embedded the arms companies in Europe are in designing European policies. Um, we have the 2009 Lisbon Treaty, which we all remember very well in Ireland because we voted no. And then we were told, no, you have to vote yes. And we voted yes the second time around. But without getting into the particularities of the Irish Lisbon Treaty debate, in 2009, we set out what is the legal underpinning in the Lisbon Treaty for what goes on to build the European defence and security policy. Um, then we have 2013, we have the European Parliament uh, resolution, which is considered to be the starting position on how to strengthen the defence industry. So from 2013, this is almost 10 years before the Ukraine war, the European Parliament is already designing policies to strengthen our defence industry. So often when you hear that the response of building up military structures within Europe is, is in response to Ukraine, this was already happening far, far, far before Ukraine war. So this was in 2013. We have in 2015 the, the development of what was known as the Group of Personalities. It was a group of 16 people who were brought together representing 16. They were they were in their personal capacity, but they were each from different entities. Um, and they were tasked with the idea of designing or advising the European Union on how it would develop its security policies going forward. So this group of personalities, 16 in total, nine of whom are directly representing arms. They're, they're either part of arms companies or arms research entities. So nine of the 16 in the group of personalities, which is the entity that goes on to design what becomes the European uh, security policy, are arms companies. They're involved in the arms companies. And so they advise on policies the policies are then implemented and then they they apply for the funding that underpins those policies and they receive that funding so it's i will tell you how to spend your money when you say yes i'll apply for that funding and then i receive it back so we have clear example of where there's a crisis in democracy because was there any civil society person involved in 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 advising the european union on how they should spend their money it's our money it's public money um and yet it's being invested in private arms companies who go on to continue to make profits from it um and so and this this has been happening for 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 at least a decade now if we go back to 2013 and then the the 
group of personalities in 2015. Um, I think we all remember the quotation from Ursula von der Leyen on the day that the Ukraine full-scale invasion of Ukraine happened two years ago today. Ursula von der Leyen, who tells us that the European Union and NATO are one union and one alliance. Um, which is, of course, hugely problematic for an Irish person because we're not a member of NATO, but it's problematic in many more ways than that. But this mm -hmm. idea that the European Union would become so closely aligned with um, with NATO is, is obviously usually problematic for all that what NATO stands for in terms of militarism. It's a military alliance. It's a war alliance. Um, there's a number of funds that I could get into. I probably don't have time on on how Europe has has developed itself since the the Ukraine war, um, the last two years. But there's one in particular: the Act in Support of Ammunition Production. Um, this came into being last summer, um, and the idea was that it would it was a fund that would come about to fund to ramp up. Uh, production of, of ammunition that could be very quickly sent to Ukraine and also um, to avail of an opportunity to replenish arms funds with arms arms production within Europe. Um, it was peppered with business speak. It removed the requirement for an impact assessment. It also encouraged states to remove normal, uh, to derogate from labor law, environmental standards, public contracts. There was a bailout mechanism included for businesses who invested and lost out. And the only thing, and I think this is very indicative, the only concern that was mentioned in the European Parliament's briefing on this funding, the only concern that was mentioned was that the war in Ukraine would end. And I think that is very telling of the mindset of the European Union. Their concern is that the war ends, not that the war continues, because if the war ends, the line, the quotation, and I have it in my notes in front of me, but I'm not sure if I find it exactly. But the quotation was to do with if the war ends, demand will drop off immediately. And this was framed as a bad thing. And this is the fund itself was for, for, for 500 million. So it pales in comparison, I think in terms of the money allocation to the billions that have been sent to Ukraine in other forms of military assistance. But I think that the logic and the thinking is what we need to interrogate. And the logic coming from Europe is the concern is the war ending. Um, I, I think the European Union has been, and I think Anu has, 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 has rightly shown us that we're not going to get the solutions to end this war from Europe. Europe is a warmongering entity. We're coming from colonialist uh, countries. We've seen very clearly, I think, with the, with the genocide taking place in Gaza, we've seen very clearly the European Union has still not, with all of what we know, has still not been able to call for a a ceasefire. In fact, we've we still haven't taken any concrete steps to stop Israel in its in its as a genocidal regime, even though even though it is on trial at the ICJ in a plausible case of of genocide. Um, so I think that it's very clear where Europe's where Europe's interests lie, and they've come to the fore very clearly in with what's happening at the moment in Palestine. And that takes me to opportunities, and I'll finish with this. Um, I was very disillusioned, I think, when we met in, in Vienna, in a way, thinking that there wasn't really such a strong global peace movement. We were very much um, sidelined and marginalized. And in fact, I think since the 7th of October and with the massive mobilizations we've seen in support of the Palestinian people, what we're seeing is a growing anti-war movement and the people who were coming out onto the streets who were calling for uh, the, to for a ceasefire in Gaza are also very much calling for a retake and a refreshing look at what is happening. Why are we going down this road to war? Why are we constantly pushing war? And we've seen very um, encouraging examples where movements have gone and blocked the movement of arms shipments. There's been trade unions who have refused to uh, to transport arms. We've even had a case in the Netherlands where the one of the courts had the courts have stopped the export of arms components for the F-35s to Israel, for example. And we're seeing other similar actions taking place, which may be specific to Palestine, maybe not. Um, but we are seeing that there is a growing movement of peace activists coming together across the globe, maybe organizing around the question of Palestine, but 
certainly organizing in terms of anti-war and that has to have an impact on the on the ongoing war in, in in ukraine i think we're also seeing the global climate movement the climate movement joining the dots between the role that the military has on on climate and the fact that you know our time on this planet is limited if we don't change course fast and the role that the military is having in that um is really being brought home with the the activism that we're seeing with the climate movements um and just maybe to pick up on one one small point i'm not sure how i'm how i'm doing on time lisa but tell me if if i've gone over um, um just, just don't, don't go over too much another minute or two okay okay i just just one thing i wanted to mention was on the role of of neutrality because as yeah most people on this call know we're doing a series on the question of neutrality and the role of mediation and negotiations Ryanair and, and nanu picked up on this um but yeah i suppose uh we have lots of positive examples where we've seen um yeah, the role of mediators, the role of negotiators um, who are playing a neutral line in trying to bring people to the table. Um, shamefully, Ireland, which is a neutral country, has not played that role in 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 the in the war in Ukraine. Um, instead, they've jumped on the bandwagon with the European Union. Um, but if yeah, hopefully, I think um, Ryanair mentioned the question of maybe a peace conference at the Vatican. I think this can, the the solutions to bring about peace are not going to come from the people in power. We've already seen, and that's why I started by explaining how embedded the arms companies and the arms industry is, in in the corridors of power. And so the, the the movement has to come from the people. And that's why I'm ending by mentioning the anti-war movement is growing much more so now, I think, with what's happening in Palestine. But that that, it, that obviously permeates through all of the attempts to have a, a growing anti-war movement, a growing peace movement. Um, 